Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. On the show this week, we've got Terrence Riley, co-founder and CEO of Ulta, one of the 12 founding teams forming the Techstars Web3 Accelerator class of 2023. Ulta is a protocol for creators and studios to create dynamic media, pushing the boundaries from generative art into interactive art and story. Ulta brings us all to life through dynamic NFTs, which enable collectors to determine the outcome of the artwork over time. Before co-founding Ulta with George Baldwin in 2021, Terrence spent 20 years working on 3D character animation projects, including the movies Jurassic World, Iron Man 2, and Paul and Chappie with clients such as Disney, Sony, Google, and Aardman, the Academy Award-winning animation studio. In this episode, Terrence and I explore the relationship between art and technology before we dive into the deep firsthand experience that Terrence has with a problem that Ulta are solving for creative coders and studios. We also talk through some examples of the Ulta protocol in action, the big opportunity that is the global art market, and what keeps Terrence moving through the ups and downs of being a startup founder. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. Amir Terrence, you're our only Irish founder in this Techstars Web3 program. I know. Well, like I was joking about this. Like, am I the diversity picture? Iron's <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's funny, actually. <laughs> yes, Terrence Riley of the Monaghan Rileys, yeah. as, yeah. as we say, right? But you've been in Bristol now for a very long time. Yeah. So, but just just thrilled that when you and I were first introduced by Brian Elders back in 2021 at the Token 2049 conference in London, right? Yeah. And I remember meeting you back then, and I think it sent you a message afterwards, and it took a little while for you to come back to me. But when you did, you were like, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're up to. And I'm like, okay, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think and have like a things have evolved. Hurts. Things have evolved since then, haven't they? Well, I don't know if they have, to, to be honest. Should I actually answer this question there? <laughs> well, I mean, what stood out for me more at the time, because I may, I may, you know, may, maybe they haven't evolved as much as I thought they did. What stood out for me at the time was you. Okay. When I met you nice. and I'm like, all right, Terrence seems like he's going to be someone that is going to figure this out. Right. And I wasn't quite sure what it was back yeah. then. I know what it is now, yeah. but has it evolved that much since? It is, well, to be honest, so our vision always was to change the art space, but, but obviously for George's art, for me, it's entertainment, but together they're creative, right, industries. What we always wanted to do was make a community artwork or enable people to make art as a community. We were calling it multiplayer art at the time, and obviously we knew Participation was a key thing because we wanted to focus in on, on real-time art. But obviously, yeah, it's expanding beyond that, you know. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, all right. right, all right. Well, listen, you thinking about your background here, Terrence, yeah. you've been involved in nearly 40 animation projects, usually for like three to six months at a time, maybe even up to a year since 2001. At least that's the number that you've got on your LinkedIn profile, right? Yeah. And yeah. that... I know that with each passing year, technology gets better, right? It gives you more options as an animator. But what do you think has moved faster over the last 20 years? Has it been the, your own creative spirit or technology? I would have to say, like, they're both symbiotic, but I think that the creative spirit might move faster than technology. However, because, you, you know, you see that in movies, you know, they, they have imagined flying cars, Adventures in space, you know, fewer worlds like in Red Player One. But, you know, then then the technologists come along and try and make that a reality. However, I feel there's a shift between who's in charge, who gets to make those creative decisions. And I think the creative technologists now are either leading teams or definitely in the room. So I I feel it's both. They're both working in tandem now. So but how do you how do you really corral that? How do you really corral the creative spirit and say, we're going to put this into a pen for three to six months. We're going to get it to do X with the technology that we have available right now. Yeah. Because this is an animation project with a budget, we don't want to 
push the boat out too much in terms of new technologies that may not be quite ready and may leave us with some technological debt to solve when we get to the post-production. And I'm winging it here. Trust me, I'm winging it here with my understanding of how this all works. Yeah. But, you know, how, you know, did, did you ever feel like you were in a pen and and restrained at all in terms of where you could go with the creative um, side of this? Yeah, 100%. Like, so that, so there's limitations on both ends. Honestly, there is. Like, you think you can imagine anything in the world, but you can't. You can't even draw it. You can't even write it, okay? That takes great skill. But... Obviously, technology takes longer. Well, I'd argue if it does. <laughs> so, but I do think that you need both if you're going to innovate, if you're going to push the boundaries. I think maybe it's more like a change in business model or a change in approach that the studios need to take. Like you've seen it with, yeah, industrial light and magic. That's literally what they've done in the VFX industry. And that's why they're one of the best companies, uh, innovative companies in the world. They, they found there was a better way of making those movies instead of practical effects. And they put money into it, you know, they, they took the time and they figured a way basically to make it happen. I think a lot of studios don't, aren't even considering that. I think what I'm saying about with the creative directors, a creative technologists coming in and sort of having a director role or a co-director role, their importance is highlighted today in studios. Before it wasn't. And, and without that, you cannot move forward, you know? So, yeah. You yeah. Know. I was thinking the Star Wars animation is coming to mind and yeah. it wasn't even on the animation. I think it's on the Mandalorian, right? Well, it's been enabled now. Like I think in those studios, they see the, the power. Like Ed Catmull was the lead person in Pixar. Like he's, he basically imagined Pixar, you know, the... He was first, so he built the engine, basically the, the tools, and then in comes uh, John Lasseter, you know, to the creative director, okay. Stanton. So I, I think it's almost like the the lead can be the, the creative technologist in some cases. So and, okay. and there, so that's my argument for Ulta. Like they're actually creative too, and I feel that's such a, a sad thing to see in the world where like you've got a visual. Or digital creators like non-coders and they're looking to a technology as like non-creatives and mm -hmm. i think that's that's a big problem yeah no i hear you i hear you now listen you told me part of the backstory before that you were inspired by a family of entrepreneurs as you said and you said yeah. to george baldwin your co-founder back in 2021 why don't we start a company and tell me did a lot of thinking go into that decision or was it just a natural outcome of the direction you were headed well, if I'm honest, like a lot of the thinking came from me it's because of the 20 years I spent as an animator, you know, in a, in a career where, you know, a lot of great stuff happened, a lot of cool projects I worked on, but behind the scenes, there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of like, you know, rejection, fear from working in that industry. I see a lot of problems and I've, I've had lots of, yeah, bad stuff basically happen. And so I, my thinking was. We need to fix this. When I said it to George, it was like, George is like, yeah, whatever. Like, let's, it doesn't matter if we set up a studio or not. Let's just do it. You know, he, he didn't really care. Yeah. Um, of course, we just wanted to do it the right way, you know, from the get go. But yeah, I think that's it. Like my, my, my thinking was, I, I did set up companies before, like a 3D printed company, 3D printed ceramics a company, tried that. And also set up, tried to set up studios before, but again, my thing was I need, before I go back, or if I ever go back to animation, I need to fix, fix the problems that I've encountered so it doesn't happen to other people in the future. Yeah. You, you mentioned some bad stuff a, mm. a minute ago. What, any, any examples of the bad stuff that, that you can point to? Yeah. It's like egos in, in the creative industry is ridiculous. The expected hours, you know, to not res the non-respect for your, your work you know, what you do, but particularly it's so exclusive to be a director, you know, like it's so hard to get into that controlled seat. I think when people get there, the ego kicks in and I've had like directors, I've asked for um, shots to work on movies on like big movies. And I've had directors basically tell me like, 
who the fuck do you think you are? Like, you know, yeah. you know, it's really shitty stuff. And I, I wasn't the only person, like, you know. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's no. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear that. You know, all if, if it's, you know, shit just being poured downhill and landing on the next person below, yeah. and that's how it works, that by the time you get to the top, after swimming through that shit, like Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption, yeah. you know, you're going to want to start shoveling some shit onto other people. It's a terrible way that the world works, and it takes someone with a really strong personal spirit once they get to the top to actually be able to treat people well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and stop shoveling is, the shit downhill. Yeah, there is pe- a lot of people that do that. But I think what's get lost gets lost in studios is that young people have new ideas and they should be utilized more. And I, I felt from working with young people, I could learn so much more. And I, I did actually work with a lot of younger people than me. And I was noticing how they were making work, you know, doing their animation. I was going like, wow, that's that's amazing. I almost felt old, 30. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. How, how long ago, speaking of, of, you know, a, a few years back, not that long ago though, Terrence, how long ago did you actually meet George? How long have you guys been working I together? I think it's about five years. I met George and I asked him to help me with my 3D printed ceramics business. Okay. And some, some coding work. And then we actually applied for a 5G grant to make, to test out a sandbox, a 5G sandbox. And we, and we picked a AOR multiplayer web experience. Okay. We actually did produce 50,000 to do this in Bristol with a university. And that was our first experience. And then that basically led on to Ulta. No. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. You're reminding me of some of my Bristol travels back in the, back in the mm-hmm. day with a shout out to Dave Henderson. Not only is he a great fintech mind, formerly of Hargraves Lansdowne, but he also shares the name with the hero of the American League Championship Series in 1986 for the Boston Red Sox. So Dave Henderson hit a game tying home run to keep the stave the Red Sox away from elimination, but then were ultimately defeated in the next round, the final round called the World Series back in 1986 by the New York Mets. But, you know. That, that's another story for another day. But he, he would hang out a, a lot around the engine shed in Bristol. Mm. Um, is that a place that you frequent? It's not, but I'm, I'm, I want to get in there now because of Anna Lisa. And I am actually going to meet her and Nick Sturge in a week or two. Cool. Uh, they've invited me to do a dinner. But yeah, I, I actually have been recently networking there because I see it okay. as a great place. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think has kept you and George together over the last five years? That's a good question. And that's, that's something I was thinking about. How do you exactly answer that? I think it's basic respect for each other. As I said, like it's about, I realize that coders are creative too. And George is a hundred percent such a creative mind as well as a technical mind. His passion for like art, you know, as he's, he's actually studied art at college then went on to be a creative programmer, you know? So he's got a very deep philosophical mind. I think that I do like philosophical chats with him, but he's definitely deeper, much deeper than me. I think, yeah, it's respect. And I think the goal is we want to change shit up, basically. You know? yeah. <laughs> We're just bored of the way things are. And I hate the expression when someone used to say to me, oh, that's the way it is, or that's just the way it is. I've heard that too many times. It's the most dangerous phrase in the human language. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. Right? Um, and what I'd like to do is dig into Ulta a bit. Yeah. And you've given us a little bit of an insight to that. But tell us, what is Ulta? Okay, well, our original idea was that we wanted to enable creative coders and, and teams to make, to make interactive art, real-time interactive art. We've seen images and videos as NFTs. And we thought, hey, why can't creative coders be seen as, you know, sell their websites basically, (laughs) but uh, with artistic intent. But so what was it then? It was, yeah, it was that. It was was basically creating features and tools to enable creative coders to make real-time art. But we had this long-term vision of, you know, what's what's more cool? What's more cool? So we thought persistent state change, you know, from day one, we wanted to do basically multiplayer art, which has turned into community art. It's, it's yep. just, uh, you know, 
a better way of saying it. Uh, but doing all that in a decentralized way is tricky, right? It's new. So, so me and George went on a journey, figuring out as we go, <laughs> how to do, you know, basically community art in a decentralized way. So we had to start with the publishing tools and, and all that sort of stuff. That's the basics, right? We, we, we actually released the first three artworks on the website. Yeah, so we started to build a platform then, profiles, and then we see other companies doing marketplace. So we thought we had to be a marketplace. So we went down the road of developing like church auctions and all this with smart contracts, but it was just, it, we've obviously realized we made some mistakes doing that because there's other marketplaces with more money and, and mm. more trust. So we didn't need to build a marketplace. We also knew we needed to differentiate ourselves because competitors come up, gen art became a thing. Now, being my background, obviously the obvious thing was straight, well, from day one, it was all about creating 3D interactive for me. If you ask George, it would probably be, it wouldn't matter if it was 3D or 2D. But I always loved immersive art and like, you know, VR, AR and stuff like that and 3D desktop web. Uh, so it was definitely that was on the cards from day one. But what is old now? So basically like we're still building tools to enable creators make interactive art. And actually we have built this already. We have built a dynamic feature that has, that allows artwork to dynamically change. So basically when you mint something, buy it or list it, the artwork will dynamically change. So the visual or new interactive controls can appear. So this is our, that, this is already built and this was our first entry into participation or co-creation for the collector to take part in the outcome of an artwork. And that was what's done before we started Techstars. Then during Techstars, we decided this could be bigger than, than that, which is already big enough. So we, we were thinking, well, let's build a protocol. And the protocol, it's essential to, to adding structure, I suppose, to a feature that would be community art based. So if you're involving people, you, you have to track every transaction, but then allow them to jump backwards and forwards. It has to track things like the state, persistent state, a changing of the artwork. Mm -hmm. And then within that, there's properties. So the artist might want a color change or a tr an object to move or opacity or, you know, all different types of things, right? So it needs to be organized. So that's why we went, went to a protocol uh, level, but above that sets the tools and the features that uh, people use. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to, just to kind of help to bring some of this to life, Yeah. you know, I'm thinking through a scenario where you've got a massive, huge video billboard up in Times Square. Yeah. Right. And where it is sponsored by some digital artist, name one, someone that you think might want to be the artistic mind behind a huge digital art installation in Times Square on a big video billboard. Name one. I'm trying to think of one of the artists, like, I want to say one of the artists of Alta. Uh, Andy Warhol? Say, <laughs> say we could go back in time and we could get Andy Warhol, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, do you have one in mind that you wanted to mention? Uh, well, I'd like to see someone like David O'Reilly. David O'Reilly. Yeah. Clo close in namesake to you. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> so let, let's take David O'Reilly, right? Yeah. And that there is a huge video billboard up in Times Square. Yeah. And people, there are fans of David O'Reilly who happen to be well-known to others as well. So celebrities or sports figures or whomever. And they say, listen, we're all going to take a stab at contributing to this piece of art. And we've got 24 hours to do this. Yeah. And over the course of these 24 hours that you can, with your entry ticket, which generally may be, say, an NFT, you'd yeah. be able to contribute to the artwork and say yeah. that we're going to have this be an overlay of all of these different types of icons and figures and brand logos and whatever it is that, that people want to contribute to this artwork. And they yeah. say, I'm going to get one one hundredth of the square on this billboard, and I'm going to put my my little own piece of art on that or my own script or my own logo or whatever. And then that happens over a 24 hour period and mm -hmm. that with each single change, Ulta can track the yeah. individual contributor to that when it happened and have this 
like you and I have talked about before, Terrence, the state machine, this yeah. digital art state machine that says at this point in time, 12 and a half hours into this 24 hour timeline on this exact date and time mm -hmm. that this is what this piece of art looked like and that I was the last contributor to it right before the next change. And I want to own that piece of it. And yeah. I can own that piece of it because of Ulta having this provenance of the point in time and what the exact image looked like at that point. And you've got this tracking and tracing mm. of contributions to art through history, which then takes on even more of a cultural significance when you tie that to what's actually happening in the world on that day, right? Yeah. So that's where I'm, my imagination is going with this. Yes. And for me, it's like, it's, ju it's that jumping back to that moment in time. So it's like, it's not just a list, it's, it's a timeline. So a timeline for a new way to distribute, a new way to publish, a new way to monetize. That sort of timeline, it's like, it's a new business model, basically, if you, if you think about it for, for art or for story. You know, yes, it's real time. And so we sort of see art to take on a situation where its audience follow along with the, the artist journey. You know, it's so let me sum it up. Like uh, art right now is, is released. There's a release date, you know, there's a pre-rendered work and it's released on this date or in NFT, it's an NFT drop. So I see that as an event, but I see in the normal way an artist works or a studio works is there's, there's events every day. There's like in animation, there's dailies. And then during between those daily events, there's like events for you to preview your work. So I sort of see art as events from the very start. And we all love to see finished work and then like the making of. So when we talk about art, anchoring art as in events, what we're really saying is that there's an untapped market there around events, um, mm. you know, so you can involve people to co-create or collaborate before an event. It can connect them together. Uh, if there's a band involved or a brand involved, you know, they're going to love this, right? You get them to the event, there could be further surprises. They can see the, their, their co-creations there. Um, and then after it's like this unique thing that they can remember and be a part of, you know? Yeah. So taking at them from the timeline, from the creation, opening up new roles for collectors for audiences and totally. giving them new roles, decentralizing art itself, I suppose. Yeah. Like I, I, one of the, one of the artists that you have featured and that I know that you've shared, uh, his work around a bit, I think it's Owen O'Keefe. Yeah. And where there is some type of facial scanner that will monitor your facial movements and yeah. will create this stream of generative art that comes out of your facial movements. Imagine, at a concert, at a gig, where you've got these face scanners happening and obviously totally anonymous, but oh, yeah. they, where, where you've got people's facial gestures being the input, being the, the color on the canvas, right? Yeah. yeah. And say you've got a, a hundred people, a thousand people at the gig and all of their facial gestures are contributing to this artwork. It's kind of like an expression of joy that music brings. Yeah. Right. And it, that's a really interesting piece of art. And say it was whoever it was, you know, for me, it would be awesome if it was Jesus. I talk about you two way too much. I don't think you two will ever have this at, at a gig because they're getting old. Right. Yeah. So maybe Bono's son, Eli, right, from yeah. their band Inhaler might have this at their gig, this expression of joy, which is this crowd sourced community artwork that's happening at a gig. Yeah. You know, all of this stuff and being able to, like we talked about, express the provenance around it is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. You Thinking about the art of the possible, no pun intended, Terrence. Yeah. Tell me what you think Ulta looks like when, for example, we've got these virtual art galleries or even like these virtual community art installations that we talked about, you know, virtual street murals come to mind as well. And when all of this gains critical mass that, you know, uh, kind of asking you this question is prefaced on the strong belief that I have that we're headed towards virtual societies. And, you know, while I take great comfort in the fact that the new Apple Vision 
Pro VR device looks a lot more like the headsets from Ready Player One than the ones that we're used to from Meta and, uh, you know, formerly the Oculus ones. I know all of this and you know all of this is a ways off. We have a lot more yeah. work to do in order to make that possible. And that has a lot more to do with fiber optic cables. There you go. So <laughs> for the crowd, Terrence <laughs> is showing off his VR headset. And, you know, to link back to kind of where this all came from, Terrence, how do you temper your own optimism for the virtual world and create value now for creators and studios that's not reliant on some big other societal tipping point like the adoption of technology. How do you do this now? Yeah. Okay. So, so start with the, the latter. Right now, I, I think it is to, to lower the barrier entry for creators so the, the creators can fail less, basically. So our idea is to create an experimental and sort of a playful space on Ulta to foster our tech and, and release it early to them and get their feedback. But, you know, what creators really want is they want to creatively challenge themselves in the work. They don't want to do the, the selling or the marketing. So building a partnership pipeline is, is very crucial at this early stage, even if it's just one and it can be a small partner. And they don't require that much, especially emerging creators like creative coders, because they're, there's not really a place that's serving them very well right now. So that's where Ulta steps in. So yeah, especially in the WebEx or the immersive art space, particularly. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is to, for the newcomers to help with onboarding is like to anchor it around events like did. So they've already been, uh, before NFTs and web tree, they've been making interactive installations in physical spaces. You know, some of them have been doing this for years in so many ways. You know, if we anchor around events, then they can, they can understand that while maybe they're not really grasping the, the current state of NFTs uh, in mm -hmm. the market today. So they can get behind that. Another thing is like, just, you know, basically be as supportive as possible with emerging artists, as well as talking with, or, or getting the conversation started and building that trust with creative directors we have in the entertainment industry it could be a studio of one or 10 or, or more and, and give them this like plugin or this like toolkit that can get in there give them an alternative route to make money but yeah i suppose that's more of a long-term goal to make money yeah well no just with the studio <laughs> side of things yeah no I want to make money now. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Well, as you're explaining this to me and and knowing that, you know, the the team size and and growing that is important yeah. in that, you know, you as founder CEO or, or you as co-founder CEO, your two most important responsibilities are going to be or are now yeah. sales and fundraising. Yeah. Right? Those yeah. are the two most important things. And you know, the, the, the other things you mentioned around innovation and community interaction and just being a good place for people to, to create that those are things that where you've got an ecosystem growth manager that you'd bring in or a partnership manager that you'd bring in. Just looking at the size of the opportunity here, Terrence, obviously the global art market is huge, right? Mm -hmm. It's massive. And, you know, getting Ulta to market now, are you looking at this kind of dauntingly or are you looking at this with a big hungry ambitious smile on your face so based on the problems that i've seen in in studio systems in the studio mm -hmm. system uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean replacing what it, what is existing it's it's a new opportunity i sort of see a lot of problems there so i suppose i would say a big hungry smile on my face however there's a bit of ways to go. So that's where I see all the sort of fitting in. It's like getting every, like the creative technologies, getting the, the coders and the animators and everyone in the same room, basically. And yeah, I've, I've had that experience with working on the Google project with Ardman. And literally there was a Google engineer sitting in the room developing YouTube 360 for the first time working with our project. So I was an animator 
animating on it. And there's a bunch of other animators, creative producers, Ardman, Jan Pinkova from Pixar, who done Tui or co-directed by Tui, and Jerry's Game. We were all in the same room. It was amazing because we were all getting to be creative. And we were making a 360 interactive short story. So wherever you look, the, the animation would trigger. But in the, in the background, you would still see other things were going on. So it wasn't yeah. just everything stopped. So yeah, yeah. And that was in 2015. So I really enjoyed that experience. And I thought it's such a shame that creators and technologists aren't in the same room at making creative decisions together. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear mm. you. And does Ulta allow them to all come into the same room together? Mm. Obviously, right? If we had our own studio, we would. And that's one of the reasons, like, like, like physically, but obviously virtually, we're enabling anyone, mm. you know, to, to join up. We don't, didn't want to restrict it to physical spaces. However, we'd love the, that's why we're, we'd love to team up with IDEO Collab. Um, they run basic collaborative spaces. And any events organizer who's doing creative challenges or hackathons or, you know, stuff that would love to partner up with, with them who have physical spaces, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So call out to, to a number of folks there to explore some potential partnerships there. Yeah. And I know we're, we're helping with a couple of those. So yeah. listen, we've, you know, we, we talked a bit about the future here, but let's really talk about the future. Imagine you did have a time machine and you could go visit your 60 year old self knowing what you think the path is that you're going down now for the next number of years, what would be the words of wisdom that your 60 year old self would give to you now? So <laughs> the thing is I had wrote, I had written down, like I was a he probably said, I can't remember, <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> out. but the, the truth is like, I think that would make sense. I think I would say that because it makes sense to me because the journey is everything. And yeah. I actually think, Going through the journey is the fun part and creators will resonate with me on that. So will coders, you know, everyone. So, but in regards to like, I suppose a personal advice from my six year old self would be, why are you not making your, your, your interactive animated story that you have an idea for? So, and it's based around basically like the IP wars. It's like, which I feel is inevitable in this space, right? We've got media giants like Disney, Netflix, their own everything. It's inevitable they're going to come in and try and take control of the NFT space. It's going to mature with IP law. So the idea would be to make a story around this and, and fix this problem on the way. <laughs> make a story, like an animated story around the IP wars. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. It's following a a band of indie entrepreneurs and creative coders to try and solve this solution and save, like how, take control of the nascent NFT industry. Because yeah, there's lots of problems to be solved, but I think if you could get a project like this going uh, and it get it's, so the idea with, with a, a real time interactive series is that you've got, it's not all done up front, like a pre-rendered thing. It's like done in sections and What's really interesting for me is to explore how you can package up and distribute an interactive series with ownership attached, and then how dynamically those like segments, like you know the, the scenes, the sequences, the beats, the story beats, can be distributed in a way and owned in a way that can then dynamically change based on human input. Yeah, and they're involved in the story. So yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing yeah. this. How this all could come together it's mind-boggling so, it is mind-boggling and yeah. i can't but help think of the <laughs> neil stevenson's not snow crash but the next yeah. book in that series diamond age and what were called reactives or interactive story and raptors which are interactive actors and that where that acting is just triggered or that mm. by the reader or by the viewer and says, which way do we want the story to go? And in this story, this young girl under the age of 10 or something was yeah. more or less her upbringing came through an interactive story feature 
yeah. that called this reactive. That yeah. so, yeah, that was written in 1995 or 96 or something like that. So you know, yeah, maybe maybe there's a shared bloodline there, Terence. A hundred percent. I and the thing is, the reason why I bring it up is because a project like this is it's such a big thing. But what would be wonderful is to see a blueprint or like someone start this off. Like choose your own adventure is is an early. Yeah. And what you're talking about as well, an early version of this. But let's let's face it, it's more than it's more than just like you know type in something. It is. It's, it's like self aware. Like and like right now, and also and it, like George built a tool where NFTs can actually have relationships with each other. You know, mm-hmm. so, like literally, one NFT can detract and the other one can, you know, grow based on what happens when someone mints or lists. But obviously we're expanding that into more property based um, definitely customization. Definitely. I'm with but you. Yeah. I, basically my six year old self would say like, why are you not playing with your tools more yeah. and, or get funding to do that? And, and believe me, I have tried. And I do feel like actually that even though tech is as incredible as it is, I think we're in a stage where content is much needed, like quality content. Because it is. If you look at all the VR headsets in the world today, what content, you know, is there that it's going to pull people in to buy those headsets and, and, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, you need the you need the operating system where developers are properly incentivized to yeah. build the applications that will be featured in that, you know, VR, AR experience. And, uh, you know, again, yeah. I think we're just a day, day or two into Apple's announcement of their Vision Pro headset. And hopefully, because we know that the operating system behind iPhones has been what it's been the real driver of that business model, not the phone itself. The phone itself is critically important from a usability and ergonomics and people want that type of thing. But listen, we're at the point of the podcast, Terrence, where I asked the final question that we ask everybody on the show. What's one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about you? <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> I've been... Uh... Well, the thing is, that I suppose, this, well, I haven't delivered it very well. The one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about me, um, that I'm funny. <laughs> and, <laughs> Are you? <laughs> well, I think so. Uh, however, well, I, 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 I laugh during our conversations. You, you've, got a, you, you've got a good sense of humor. I'll give you that. Yeah, or, or maybe weird sometimes, but the, or awkward as well. So, like, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm funny, but I'm also very serious so i'm quite extreme in a sense where so some people don't know how to take me i can be really silly and then also really serious about silly stuff (laughs) 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 so one thing that i suppose i was thinking of it's uh, really important that you do not laugh at this joke (laughs) yeah don't one thing i was thinking was that i suppose let's see i don't know if this makes is this really answering the question? But let me see it anyway. So basically, my my mum used to act out like random performances uh, instead of reading books to me as a kid. Okay. And she loved to inject her imagination and um, bringing life to the teddies and the objects in the room. And I suppose that probably was the driving factor for me to to express myself as an animator and to work in the industry for twenty years. But you know people don't expect is that how seriously I, I take that creativity and that, that silliness, I suppose, like the, cause I do it in front of my own kids. Yeah. I can act out stuff like that and having a career in animation, people think, oh, that's a fun thing, you know, but it's not all fun. It's, it's not a serious concentration. It's hard work, hard to master. So yeah. And it's, yeah, I suppose that's the thing. Like, you know, I love to, like in the anime studio, act out in front of the camera. It's you're so fun, vulnerable. So yeah. you have to be vulnerable. You have to be ready for critique every day, every minute. So I'm very vulnerable, but also really stubborn. <laughs> to I I hear that. Yeah, I hear that. All right. Well, listen, that is fascinating. Yeah. I think we could go on for a long time at digging into that, and that is. Yeah. The story of Diamond Age. So I'm I'm gonna park that, okay. and I know that we can go down this rabbit hole another time because we'll have plenty more time to do that. But Terence, listen, thank you 
It's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you so much. And looking forward to talking to you again later on. Yeah, thanks very much, Pete. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Terrence Riley for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. And you can learn more about Terrence and Ulta in the show notes on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify as it helps others to find the show. Thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3. And I lead the Techstars Web3 Accelerator. There are plenty of links in the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie and how to get in touch, so don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See you.